Black Friday is going to start in October. Not only are they going to start weeks and weeks earlier, but they've got way more stuff than they need. I guess supply chain's been figured out. <laughs> so, and this is Pod Heifer. I'm, Russell, this is Pod Heifer. I'm John Stevens. Hey, so today uh, we're just going to riff on a couple of things. Current events, some things that sort of stimulated mind and thought. Yeah. Um, you can also call it potpourri, or you can call it like, uh, hey, this is a good week not to, to listen. Um, but is there let, ever a good week not to listen? No, I think you should listen all the time. <laughs> but let me just give you a heads up so you have like, you know, always like an agenda. It's like, wait, what are we going to talk about today? Right. So I'm going to tell you, we're going to talk about millennial church attendance. Woo! We're going to talk about... <laughs> that won't take long. We're going to talk about <laughs> William Shatner... Oh. Traveling to space. And what he saw. And he said all he saw was death. <laughs> we're going to talk about that. We're, <clears throat> we're going to talk about... He said um, the same thing when he traveled to Arby's, though. So I don't know, <laughs> I don't know if it's about space or just William Shatner. <laughs> we're we're going to talk about um, getting ready for Black Friday. Okay. Oh, yeah. Even though it's two months away. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. And our <laughs> consumer <laughs> our consumer passion possessions yeah. sort of... Uh, we might talk about... Uh, trying to diagnose the difference between am I just sad or am I like clinically depressed? Depressed. And then the other thing is I went to a luncheon today, Houston Methodist Faith and Medicine. And so we'll start with that. But it was just fascinating that there were all these stories coming out of COVID and how Houston Methodist is just such a unique hospital because faith is such so interwoven in what they do. Mm -hmm. And so there was a Muslim doctor that got up and talked about the faith component. You know, there's yeah. spiritual Christian chaplains, a Jewish rabbi. But one of the things that struck me, there were some great testimonies. That the two things that struck me is there was a video, and I hope we can find it. I'd love to share it, maybe on this podcast or other, of a, a couple who in September of 20 got COVID. They mm -hmm. were both in ICU. They were both in induced comas. I mean, very serious. Oh, wow. uh, when she came out of it she found out that her husband had passed away mm. like 15 days earlier or something like oh. that. And so as she was going through this and she asked for her medical records and his medical records and she was combing through them. And what's interesting is that at Houston Methodist, she said in her medical records were listed the visits by the chaplain, the prayers that he prayed, the messages he communicated to her from her family and to him. And you're watching this video, and I mean, just people are tearing up. I didn't even see it, I'm tearing up right now. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> and I just amazing. thought, this is, uh, this is an amazing, they talked a little bit on the panel about faith and healing, and mm -hmm. how there's not really a lot of groups that study it, yeah. and that, that doctors are trained, they'll ask you just about anything. They'll ask you about like your drug use, your sexual practices, right, right. they very rarely ask you about your faith. They feel there's some disconnect that they can't do that. And <laughs> this one doctor that was talking about this, said that, that, that at Houston Methodist, they wanna try to begin to start studying because they know that faith makes a difference in your healing. Yeah. They know that. And I think it's accepted, generally it's accepted. They don't know exactly how. But it was, it was just an interesting thing. And then they, they put iPads in people's room during COVID because they wanted them to be able to intersect with care better. So they had their mm -hmm. my chart there. They could order their, their dinner or their meals there, okay. you know, all this stuff. But the, the spiritual care, the chaplains decided, we have to have a resource here on this iPad, spiritual resource. So there were prayers and there's scripture readings by all these different chaplains. And depending on your faith tradition, or if you don't have any faith tradition, you could go and play that. And it, and they would just say, you know, would you do one of these, a pastor? Uh, what would you say to someone who's in the hospital that you couldn't get to? So like a YouTube they could access? Yeah, or it was a resource. It, it was yeah. like uh, uh -huh. this great resource. But it just made me think, it's like sometimes we forget that outside in the world, uh -huh. you know, in, in, in these realms, it's like we talk about the the how religion is declining and church attendance is declining. Yet I'm telling you, faith and spirituality has a profound oh. foothold in society. Yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, I mean, you've, you've stood at the bed and at the bedside of, I'm sure, thousands of folks. Um, like, what would you say would be the, the connection between faith and health? Like, just as a pastor looking, looking on. Well, I mean, I, I, I learned early on when you're young and even when you're old, sometimes you think it's about you. 
mm. right? Yeah. And you realize it's not about you as, as a pastor or in that priest role. Mm -hmm. You're there on behalf of someone else. You know, you're there as an incarnate presence. And I remember learning from a mentor of mine years ago that sometimes you just are in the room, standing in the corner as mm -hmm. just a presence. And the presence itself means something, yes. right? And then just understanding the, the transcendent moments that happen when you're in the room with people who take their last breath and their family are, is around them. You know, it's a deeply sad moment, but in almost every situation, there's some sense of, I don't know, it's kind of hard to, to name the exact word. I wouldn't say joy. I don't know that it's joy, but there's some uh, hopeful slash beneficial it, there's there's weeping but it's almost like a cleansing as much as it is a grieving yeah there's all of that it, it's yeah. it's all together it's not just one simple thing or the other yeah yeah and there's a moment when people cross over yeah there's that's just a very sacred and holy moment mm. so i think for us it's just presence and i think that's you're trying to figure out during COVID how can people be present how can faith be present yeah you know, on an ipad um, yeah, right. You know, right. there was a story of a nurse who would talk to the family, uh, you know, yeah. every day in this COVID patient and wanted to know the names of the kids and the grandkids and the stories because this nurse was the only person front facing directly with this. The only physical grandfather, wow. father, and they wanted to say to him, you know, you're the reason why we're a family of faith. You're the reason why Tony is, you're the reason why Timmy, you're the reason why, and she was doing this. And this family is like, we will never forget that. Oh. Cause they couldn't get there, couldn't yeah. get in there. So it was just a powerful, um, it was a powerful luncheon of faith and medicine. And I know hospitals do great work, but there's something unique about Houston Methodist. It's one of the, it's one of the top 15 um, hospitals in the country and the number one hospital in Texas. And of the top 15 in the country, it's one of the very few on that top 15 list that is a faith-based hospital. Amazing. Well, that, that, uh, when I was in England, um, the, my, one of the professors I studied with was a guy named Fraser Watts who was an evolutionary psychologist and also was a, a priest. And, um, and I, um, I, I went to the. I was. I worked at the church he was a priest at, um, and there was a healing service that he did every um, every month. And I asked him one time, um, and w there was a laying out of hands, and he always kind of insisted that we lay hands on folks on the top of their head. And I asked him one time, why was that, you know? And how does he? How did he square kind of his scientific background with his faith background, particularly like in this these healing things, and he had. He had felt like that often the church forgets about the healing ministry of Jesus, that I, the world came to Jesus because they expected maybe they could get healed. Hmm. And, uh, and he said that um, he, he thought it was important to lay hands on people on their heads when there, were, there was prayers for healing because <clears throat> he said often in primates, it's a, it's a deeply, it's like within our, our – uh, uh, our brain system, our, st our brain stem, that the systems of belonging, or when you touch somebody on their head, it's like grooming, and you're you're taking care of them. And at the deepest point, when we're ill, we feel deeply disconnected from the thing that we uh, need to be connected to most, which is people and our community and our tribe and who we are. And that he 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 thinks that that the laying of the hands tells people when they're sick that even this will not disconnect you from who you are with us. And, um, and, and I've noticed that often in medical situations, people are touched only when they're probed, <laughs> only when there's blood taken, only when they're stuck poked, with something, prodded. poked, prodded, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and that I think you're right. There's something about like the, the ministry of chaplaincy and the body of Christ um, that moves beyond the poking and the prodding that says, no, you belong to us. So speaking of connection, segue to, again, this potpourri random. Yeah, yeah okay. This is going to be, this will be the, the non sequitur uh, version of Pod Have Mercy. So um, William Shatner yeah. wrote a book recently. He went into, uh, he took a, a ride into space, you know, on yeah, one of these did. you can yeah. go up on the spaceship. And, you know, of course... William Shatner, everybody knows, was 
Captain James T. Kirk. To boldly go. In Star Trek. <laughs> yes. Scotty, I need more power. <laughs> Spock, you're too uh, intellectual. I'm giving her all she's got. I'm giving her all she's got, Captain. <laughs> I need more power, Scotty. But, um, but he went what was interested. This is what I thought was interesting and how it connects when you're talking about human connection. Yeah. So he said he went on to this suborbital, suborbital, that's easy for me to say, space tourism flight last year. And how most astronauts would describe going into space as breathtaking, a reminder of the Earth's fragility and humanity's need to serve as stewards yeah. of the planet. Shatner said that he had this distinct observation that when he went into space and he looked back at Earth, he said, all I saw when I thought about the black expanse of the cosmos, all I saw was death. Mm. Now, when you, you hear that at first, you're like, well, what in the hell is he talking about? Yeah, yeah. But when you read it, this is what's interesting to me is, of course, he talks, you know, if you know William Shatner, you've ever listened to him sing music on these albums or interview him. The guy is a little, a goofy. little he's a couple of <laughs> notches short of sane sometimes. I think he's kind of this shock jock. But what he says is he goes, I could see a cold, dark, black emptiness, yeah. unlike any blackness that you can see or feel on earth, deep, enveloping, all encompassing. It, and I turned back toward the light of home and I could see the curvature of the earth, the beige of the desert, the white of the clouds, the blue of the sky, and I saw life. Mm. I saw nurturing, I saw sustaining life. And I realized I was leaving the life. I was leaving the connection. He said, everything I thought was wrong. Everything I expected to see was wrong. But in that moment, when you were talking about connection, there's something about how he travels into space and he looks back and he goes, that's where the life is. Uh. <laughs> it's back there on earth. <laughs> wow. That's where the connection is. That's where the power, that's where the, the nurturing and the formation and the connectivity is. You go out into space and it's sterile, right? It's just, uh, um, and he said it took him a little while to, to, to sort of figure out what it was. Um, he said, oh, but you know, good. he said human beings, he said we're the only species alive on this planet that we're aware of the enormity and the majesty of the universe. But he also realized, you know, like you go out into space and you're disconnected. Mm -hmm. So it was just interesting to me that, you know, here's Captain Kirk. And yeah. He's like going out to beyond, yeah. the, and yeah. that's his dream. Yeah. And in real life, this guy looks back and he goes, that's where the nurturing happens. Right. That's where the connectivity is. Right. That's where life is, not up here. Yes. It's back down there. Yeah. And it took him going into space to figure that out. That's that's beautiful. There's a um, there's a sense sometimes that I have that, like like the grass is greener kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You know that maybe that's this human thing that if we could get somewhere else, you know, we, it would be better. If I would have taken this path differently, it would have worked out this way better. Always, not worse. And it's really encouraging to have someone launched into space. You know, this kind of this infinite place that you think you know where all of our dreams are to only turn around and go, wait, the dream, all the dreams that I have of what I just left, you know, where I'm at right now is the life that we're Think about nurture. all the space movies though, where people take off, like to go journey into space. Yeah. And what do they do? They get into some isolated sleep pod for <laughs> 200 years, years, right? Yeah. I mean, really, yeah, honestly, right. if you think about it, yeah. I mean, going into outer space, all this space exploration and stuff, there's, there's a disc, there's a disconnection. You, you're so yes. isolated. I mean, I, I'm just going down all these movies yeah. where, think about Alien, you know, Sigourney Weaver, she's the last one there all by herself, you know, <laughs> she's isolated and cut off. And um, I don't know, you were just talking about the connectivity, human yeah. connectivity. Yeah. And it's like, it's right here in front of us every day. Yeah. Relationships, like we talk about, you know, the, the, the greatest sense walking away from the table, walking away from fellowship, walking right. away from relationships. And yeah. yet we do it every day. Yeah. We, yeah. Often without a thought, you know, or we don't let it affect us in the way that it, um, it should and needs to. That's, that's great. Well, wow. he is, um, <clears throat> he's an interesting dude. If you ever, if you've never listened to him sing songs, there's, he's, he's like cut albums. Yeah, I don't think I'd ever like it's, put him on my Spotify playlist, bro. 
just saying. <laughs> Far beyond the galaxies, I've journeyed to this place to study the behavior patterns of the human race. And Leonard Nimoy. Leonard Nimoy. And if you go watch this video, it's like like the 60s where they do it all. Like, oh, yeah. And the girls are go-go dancing. It's highly illogical. This is, this is my favorite. She packed my bags last night pre-flight. <laughs> This is going to get us pulled up. Zero hour, 9 a.m. So, see, I, if you play it in less than 30 seconds, can you get away with it? What's yeah, I think the, it's 15. Oh, 15 seconds. I think sorry. You're good there, okay. Well, anyway, yeah, so go listen to. So, <laughs> it felt I just like talked about. 15 seconds. <laughs> so, I just well, talked about <laughs> William Shatner going into space. When you go home today, listen, pull it up on Spotify or whatever, you, and listen to Rocket Man by William Shatner. Yeah. I don't even know how to segue from William Shatner <laughs> to, uh, rock, to uh, Rocket Man. So uh, holidays are coming up. Uh, you know, we're not far away from it. I thought this was interesting. The Wall Street Journal had an article actually yesterday about how Black Friday is going to start in October. Rocktober. So this is what I don't understand. Halloween. Yeah, what is that? It starts it, like... Bef like beginning of October. Halloween's like a month long celebration now for some people. Yeah. I think it's like, is it like the second most popular holiday for purchasing decorations and stuff? I think it is. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did you know that? I, I, I know, but I, I would have guessed just driving through my neighborhood. Yeah, speaking, <laughs> speaking of Israel, there was a, I it was a Baptist church or something that said, we're not going to call it Halloween. We're going to call it Holy Ween. <laughs> Holy Ween. And I'm just sitting there, <laughs> and, I, and I'm sitting there going, hey, "Is somebody going to tell him? Like, <laughs> so, Hallow means holy, holy, yeah. like yeah. that in the in yeah. the old English is like Hallow's Eve is holy. Somebody, <laughs> and you just made it worse. Somebody tell him, <laughs> holy, Ween. thirteen year old boy in the world. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, now now you got to start. Like we put our decorations up early because we usually travel we'll go see family yeah. on thanksgiving so we try to put it up so that when we get back from thanksgiving it's up but i'm embarrassed to tell people we do that because well, it seems too early i remember the uh it was a couple years ago in lockdown didn't you guys put them up in like july oh, we put them up yeah because you just up. needed a little cheer no yeah just we started <laughs> like it was like early november yeah, i remember you saying yeah. they're going up folks. well like, we didn't have anything else to do i mean AC is going down to yeah <laughs> yeah but it was just like we need something we to look started, here we folks. started christmas music i never start christmas music before thanksgiving we started christmas music like october <laughs> i just love that i i think <laughs> There was something about that that I think maybe, you know, is a good tradition. But, so, yeah. but anyway, so these all these big stores, Target, Walmart, um, all these big stores, mm. and they're going to kick off Black Friday in October. And Black Friday, I used to always think that was the Friday after Thanksgiving, and everybody went to right. the store to shop. And then it kind of went a little online, and then you went in the morning. Now, I don't know if anybody still actually goes or not, but... It's interesting to me, but what, what was also interesting in this article is that they announced not only are they going to start weeks and weeks earlier, but they've got way more stuff than they need. I guess supply chain's been figured out. <laughs> so, yeah, they thought they weren't going to be able to get it in time because got of inflation. That got unclogged. <laughs> and, uh, and supply chain issues. So anyway, the good news is, according to this article, that... Um, you're going to find some really aggressive discounting. So hold on, people. Oh, wow. It's time for you to just give in to those just, consumeristic just tendencies. Just more crap. That's all the soul all you need soul is needs. more stuff. Just more crap. <laughs> well, I'm excited for the holidays. I, yeah. I mean, I don't know. It's changed. I used to be more of a little bit of a bah humbug kind of, uh, you know, going into it, but... I don't know. There's something about it. I, I don't know the last couple of years changed my attitude yeah. towards it. Yeah. Because we've already talked about when, that, you know, we've already targeted the weekend that we're going to put Christmas decorations up. That's great. It's going to be early. I'm just telling you, so don't send me a note and tell me how on the second week of November <laughs> that I'm a horrible be human being. I'm, I'm just going to do it. Hey, you know what? I was driving by Memorial City Mall last week. They're putting dec like, like wow. cr full-on Christmas well, decorations up. Well, they've always up. done that. And, and I've always poo-pooed that i've always like look at that look at those horrible people putting up christmas decorations in october That's and so November. Funny, John. but i have been redeemed i have been yeah. 
saved. That's good. Now Metanoid. Just, yeah, metanoid. <laughs> I mean, I just, because I just need, it's, it's like I said, I just need yeah. more of that. Hmm. Right. You know, I want Johnny Mathis for more than like two weeks. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I talked I, to a guy last year and I, we were talking about this and he's like, yeah, I don't do that. He goes, I, I listen to Christmas music like the week before Christmas and that's it. Yeah. Like you are a miserable human being. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I've been around some like, um, I, I, I'll try to figure out how to say this in a way that's not too offending. Some people that really take the liturgical rhythm of the church a little too. No Christmas Carol. Yeah, right? And so there's not, you can't sing Advent. certain, yeah. And so it's Advent is all about this kind of longing and waiting. And I get that. That's absolutely no beautiful. Hello, Rose, no <laughs> me. I see ground hard as wrong. I think we got a Christmas album coming on with John. <laughs> so like William Shatner's greatest yeah. hits. You and William. <laughs> no, I mean it the you know the the preparation. I get it. I mean, but it's important. And also, joy to the world, man. <laughs> but she, the, the the church, I think that's one of the things it's like may, maybe maybe we missed it or whatever, but you you it, I'm not saying you have to totally give in to the culture, but you got to figure out people are like as soon as Christmas Day is over, Christmas is over. The whole twelve days of Christmas and the Christmas season. Oh no! That like all of a sudden, if you're on that liturgical calendar, oh Christmas Day. Now it starts for the next twelve days. We get to celebrate. People are like, "Who are you?" It's New Year's yeah, now, right? I'm starting to die. Right, you and twelve people in the world are on your calendar now. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And plus, the little Advent calendars with the chocolates oh. in them, they run out December twenty fifth. <laughs> I mean, no, that's liturgical it. Liturgical calendars. That's it. That is a liturgical calendar. <laughs> And there's a but I do like epiphany. I do like the three wise dudes, you know, showing up later and all that stuff is pretty fun. How do you know there are only three? Uh, that's what that's what the flannel graph taught me, John. Oh. <laughs> it's only three. <laughs> anyway, I I I'm excited about the holidays, so it's going to come. So uh, so the last thing we'll talk about, um, you know, it's it's interesting to me. I was reading an article. You know, every week you're trying to read up on things and what's going on in the world. We're religious. You know, sometimes people say, well, look around the church and not, a many, not as many people here as before. But you don't see all the people that are now streaming online that mm -hmm. you didn't have before. I mean, like three times more, four times more people streaming, watching mm -hmm. online yeah. than, than we did before COVID. It's crazy. And, and people engaging in different ways. Like I know you have a, a Sunday school hour. Mm -hmm. Some folks will come to that as their primary... Mm -hmm. engagement like in church mm -hmm. right uh, so people intersect it in different ways yeah. too but one of the things is uh barna came out with this says since the pandemic now this is since the pandemic hmm. that they've been tracking worship shifting uh because of the uncertain digital and physical realities of churches uh in america and so there's a new reality they call it the new sunday morning and this is, I think, what we're wrestling on. What's going on with church attendance or people that pay any attention to this kind of stuff? But what's interesting is that um, when you look in your own church, you might see something. But I think it's interesting to look across the, the generational spectrums and see what they're saying here from just the statistics. Millennials, do you know what millennials are? They're an odd, mysterious <laughs> bunch of folks, John. <laughs> you know, we talk about these um, these they age. Usually, have a lot of tattoos. Hey, it's true. Well, it's true. Are you, are you a millennial, Jeff? I am, but I don't have any tattoos yet. <laughs> so blank canvas. Send me your ideas. Millennials are <laughs> Generation Y. Mm-hmm. And they typically are the demographic, so they they follow Gen X. We are Gen X. We are. Gen we're not X. baby boomers. Our no, parents were slacker baby boomers. generation. We're we're Gen X, and then my children are Gen Z. I mm -hmm. think that's about right. Or maybe my older daughter might be a little millennial. But um, millennials are typically defined. Let's see, researchers da, 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 from the mid '90s to the early 2000s as ending birth years. So. Those are millennials. Is that right? Did I get that right? Yeah, sounds Ow. good. So anyway, this it, it, they're think in terms of millennials are people in their approximately their thirties, maybe early forties um, age group, right? The, what they're finding is that the church 
attendance from this demographic is rising. So weekly church attendance by generation uh, from 20, if you go back to 2019, it went up in 2020, it went way down in 2021 by all demographics. But millennials in 2022 hmm. are rising Coming back. and church attendance not only higher than they were before the pandemic, but higher than baby boomers were before the pandemic at a rate, at a percentage rate. Yes. Higher than their grandparents. Higher than I wonder if it's because having kids. Yep, yeah, maybe some of the, the phenomenon of, of like young, so young what they people say, with kids coming back. What they say here, this is interesting to me because we don't see this. Sometimes I think, you know, I'll get messages or emails from people and they just make these blanket statements about the world of religion and church attendance just based on what like what they see in their church right what they see in their pew what they've heard yeah it's anecdotal it's just my own yep. if it happens in front of me it's real and if it doesn't it doesn't but when you look across the board what you find is that all the aggregate data from 2019 to 2022 shows the fluctuations affecting all generations mm. in 2021 there was less than a 10 percentage point difference between church attendance of millennials, Gen X, boomers. So interesting. Yeah. Although millennials are known for declines in religiosity, if you look across the board in American religious culture, millennials seem to be the ones in the most decline. But data shows that since 2019, the percentage of millennials reporting weekly church attendance has increased from 21% to 39%. Wow. Now, is that because they're having children and the children are now coming along you know sometimes people return to church when they get kids and gen x is up as well in this it, chart yes it's just well they're all up but the younger generations are up actually yeah. at a higher percentage rate Bo than boomers baby aren't boomers. up boomers are down boomers are up slightly from Wait, is this church attendance yeah the, the red yeah they're, weekly church attendance they're, they're down up. from from 2020 right mm -hmm. and of course non-white millennials are up at a much higher rate than white millennials. Wow. So it's just, it's interesting when you look at it. In 2019, a breakdown of church attendance by race showed that one quarter of white adults, 26%, and three in 10 non-white adults, 31%, were attending church weekly. So think about that. A third of the millennials are attending church weekly. Yeah. So I think it's just interesting that sometimes we make, uh, we make these assumptions about religious life and i'm certainly not saying that it's turning the corner and we're back to where we were in the 60s i don't think that's ever going to happen but the last thing on this particular study that was interesting to me if you go down later in the in the study church attendance in 2022 if you go back and look now at all churched adults versus millennials gen xers and boomers boomers are returning at the highest rate in person yes um Okay. They're also increased online, but they have the smallest percentage of doing online and in person. So baby boomers, the older generation, they're like, I'm either going to be there or I'm going to on, watch online. It's one or the other. Boomers are saying that. Boomers at a higher percentage, whereas the millennials and Gen X watching way more both and they're online and they're in person. So they're engaging in this hybrid uh sort of way of engaging with church which i think is fascinating to me millennials the most so i don't know i think there's some stuff that we're going to continue to have to wrestle with and think i i think spirituality and faith is alive in our world i think the problem with the church is that we expect it to be seen or experienced in the way we have always experienced and seen it mm. or we want it corralled a certain way defined a certain way that is agreeable to us mm -hmm. and then if it is if it's outside that box we're not really sure if we would define that as acceptable yeah. yeah and that's why i think you see some declines in specific congregations or denominations it's it's not what some of these folks would tell you theological because you're more inclusive of lgbtq or you're not that that's not what's moving the needle. Not according to the not yeah. according to the demographics. Not according to the research. That's not now. It it affects the relationship within denominations. Yeah, sure. You know they they split. Yeah. They fight. That. But when you look at what the culture is saying, the culture's like that's not the, the issue the, for us. Yeah. 
It's yeah. not the issue for us. And even in like in our denomination, they want to fight over, well, you don't believe in Jesus or you don't believe in the virgin yeah, birth. Yeah. The, the culture is not concerned about that either. And I'm not saying that doesn't matter, but what I'm saying is that's not their thing that they're like looking at and going, that, that's internal, like pharisaical, yeah, organizational, yeah. religious, yeah. institutional yeah. power yeah. wrestling. Throwing stuff at each other. Yeah, yeah, and that's, yeah. that's yeah. this much of people. Yeah. That's yeah. like the very small percentage of those of us really who are fighting those battles. It's one of the things that I've learned too is as I look on social media or online and I hear, you know, especially in our United Methodist uh, splintering, people that are, that are leaving or wanting to leave and they'll post things or things that are not true or things that are mischaracterizations or things that are misinformation. And I used to think, oh, I need to set that right. Now I'm just like, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Cause you know, who's hearing that the same people in their echo chamber, yeah. they're yeah. not gaining any, yeah. there's no, you're not gaining any, uh, market share. It's it's not, mm. I mean, it, it's, it's like politics. It's mm. all baked in. Yeah. It's all baked in, you know? There's a certain percentage here and a certain percentage here, and you're fighting for this like three to five percent <laughs> in the middle, uh, um, and it's this. It, that's the way it is in the United States right now, and I think it's baked in. So the churches that are leaving United Methodist Church or pastors that are leaving, there was kind of an, an element or percentage of it that was baked in, and so of thirty three thousand churches in the United Methodist Church, I'd say three to four thousand churches disaffiliate. If I had to guess in the United States, what's the over and under? Over and under 3275. <laughs> I'm going to put the line. <laughs> no, I mean, I just don't see, I just don't see it being more than 4,000 churches in the United States. But I, I wonder, like, so the, it's interesting to me that folks had not. And been, people outside of the United Methodist Church or the global, they don't really care. They don't, yeah. The they what? don't give a flying the rat's ass. They don't care. <laughs> what, yeah. But I wonder also the folks that are coming back, what are they looking for? Like that'd be really like because if we, if we as a community don't, I think sometimes don't um, divine and understand the culture and the time we're living in and what people's pain points are, what they're carrying around, and just think we're going to reheat what we've been doing for the last two hundred years, we're going to miss it. I think that that to be able to look at the culture of boomers and Xers and millennials and Y all you know, the generations that say folks that are coming back, what are they hungry for? Mm-hmm. What are they looking for? Jesus has stuff to offer. It's an integrated uh-huh. faith. I mean, yeah. like when we talk about what we do here, people will really resonate with. Okay, yeah. we're going to preach the scripture. We're mm-hmm. going to have a high view of, of scriptural authority. We're going to put this out there, and it's going to challenge us. Yeah. And, but we're going to put it in, 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 the, in the context of where we live our lives, how we live our lives, what we're doing every day. So when we talk about Micah 6, 8, yeah. doing justice, what is that looking like? Yeah. Well, that's not just me winning what I want. That's looking out for the vulnerable. That's looking out Amen. for the, the lack of justice. The you people can actually go voices. do that. And not That's just what talk the Bible talks about with justice, right? <laughs> right, right? Not just what you think is justice. Yeah. There's justice that you fight for as for you to gain power. And then there's biblical justice of where God is reaching into the spaces where people are vulnerable, marginalized, without a voice, without a seat at the table and advocating for those people. Yeah. And often it means guys like you and me losing power, giving yeah. up that power. Exactly. The kenosis. Or, and, or using our privilege or using our power to open the door and to make way for others to speak into and to lead. Yeah. Well, it's been fun. I know it's just been potpourri day. Um, We'll see how well that goes. Buckshot. We could have talked Buckshot. about, you know, we, we, could, if, we could talk about college football. But, what about I mean, the Astros? The Astros are playing as we record as we this, speak. which just goes to First show pitch. you how horrible we are as fans. We haven't even checked the score yet. It's da- the they're, score? they're down one, one to nothing one. in the first. Dear Lord, can we sh- say a little prayer? No. Hey, you don't ever worry about the Astros. They okay. can score runs. Yeah. yeah. It's going to be okay. Back okay. to heat up. Go Strohs. That's right. They're playing the Mariners, though, aren't they? Yep. Talking about spirituality. <laughs> hand- home. Talking about spirituality Dude. in the culture and the context, if you go to H-E-B, which is a grocery store chain here in Texas for those Also known as Heeb. Heeb. The Heb. Heeb. <laughs> you, they sell um, Jose Altuve rosary beads and Jose Altuve uh, candles. incense candles. Yep. That you can burn during the... So, so people who really want to get their religion on, their spirituality on with the Astros, sort of this hybrid thing happening... And Nolan Ryan beef. 
And Nolan Ryan beef. <laughs> so you can eat um, Nolan Ryan beef and burn an Altuve candle. <laughs> I and mean, the Nolan I mean, Ryan beef that's is, a combo. is that's way a better than the, than the 44 Farms that sponsors Jimbo Fisher <laughs> that's and the Texas A&M. I'm going to get in trouble. You know what? We you might are. be able to get sponsored by 44 not, Farms. Not anymore. Yeah. No, not anymore. All right. Well, this has been fun. Hey, make sure when you uh, pull up the podcast wherever you listen to it, whether it's on YouTube or in your podcast app, make sure you like it. Make sure you subscribe to it. Make sure you share it. Make sure you do all those sorts of things. What else, Jeff? Am I not cool enough to know about branding? <laughs> but if you, but what happens is if you do that, if you, if you are, that helps us to sort of platform out even more. It yeah. reaches out into broader uh, audience and connections, so you can have an influence by just clicking those buttons. Yeah. So. And somewhere a puppy doesn't die. That's right. Just hey saying, y'all. safe. Every time <laughs> a bell rings, an angel. Is that right? Yeah. Something like that. Angel gets Wonderful. Wings, yeah. yeah, right. Well, hey, this has been fun. I'm John Stevens. And I'm Matt Russell. And this is Pod Have Mercy. Mm-hmm.